Hello, everyone. My name is Marcos Barrera, and I am the lead robotics and AI research engineer for Seafloor Systems. It is a tremendous honor to be with you here today at Remars, and I hope you've enjoyed seeing all the robots running around as much as I have. Now, I thought the best way to introduce myself and introduce you all to Seafloor Systems is to start off with showing you a picture. And you could consider this a family photo, a robot family photo. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with what we do at Seafloor, you may be able to tell from this picture that we build uncrewed and autonomous surface vehicles. Now, in the industry, they're called USVs and ASVs. But basically, we manufacture robot boats. Now, I'm very excited to talk with you about all the adventures our yellow robot boats have gone on. But first, I wanna show you another picture that's really important to us at Seafloor. Now, squiggly lines probably don't mean a whole lot to you guys, but this particular set of lines means a lot to us. Now, let me give you a bit of background. What you're seeing here was a project that Seafloor was asked to do in the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta. Now, any time data needs to be collected by transecting a river, it is an extremely complex task and prone to error. When a crewed boat takes on a task like this, which is basically driving a boat back and forth across a river, they're battling currents while attempting to maintain as straight a line as possible. Now, a crewed boat team can expect roughly 100 feet of cross-track error as they're collecting data from one pass to the next. And now you can see that in those lines at the top. We had the opportunity to an attempt an identical project using our autonomous hydron, which is our smallest robot. Our little robot was able to maintain the lines you see there at the bottom and achieve less than 10 feet of error. Now, this squiggly set of lines proved to us and to others that we could quantifiably and repeatedly outperform humans at a difficult task. But there was one thing else. It told us that we were doing something right. While our fleet of robot boats can collect a litany of different types of data, our business started by providing hydrographic survey equipment to different industries. Now, hydrographic surveying is fundamentally using sound to explore underwater. Now, we learned a lot at Seafloor Systems by going out with hydrographers in the field and helping them utilize their sonar systems. These systems emit signals from the water surface that bounce off the bottom and determine the depth of the water. Now, the true power of this technology is the, the ability to link those sonar pings to highly accurate GPS uh, coordinates. Now, hydrographers can take this data and then fundamentally build a map of the underwater terrain. Now, the collection and accuracy of this data is critically important to a variety of industries. It's in, uh, important to environmental research, search and recovery, dredging and infrastructure projects, mining, as well as oil and gas. It was during these initial years of field work that we realized that there are certain scenarios where using traditional boats with a sonar system is not the best tool for the job. Once the waters get extremely challenging, they in turn get dangerous for those people that are collecting the data. It was out of this discovery that the Hydrone uncrewed surface vessel, that USV you see there, was born. Now the picture you see here is a great example of a challenging environment where a storm surge has made navigating by a traditional boat nearly impossible. By using a USV, the teams of people that need that data for critical post-storm cleanup and disaster mitigation can collect the hydrographic surveys and either analyze them in real time in the field for direct operational intelligence or collect it for post-processing for a more detailed analysis. From those initial days, our family of yellow robot boats has grown. But what we are most proud of is how our customers and research partners use them. What started as a business focused on the hydrographic survey industry has developed into our autonomous platforms being used for everything, from pesticide management in waterways and golf courses to solar-powered moored platforms collecting connected via LoRa for water quality samplings in the tailing ponds of mining industry. 
we have over 3,000 uncrewed systems in the field globally, as well as a thriving rental business, which I guess in an interesting turn makes us a robot as a service company. But for me personally, the most exciting aspect of our business is the fact that we have partners that have started their own businesses from renting our robot boats for a project here and there, but over time have built up enough personal business to purchase their own or multiple seafloor ASVs, ultimately becoming their own robot as a service company. So our story and the stories I'm gonna tell you today are less about us and more about the inspiring work being done in the world by our amazing customers and research partners because this is what drives us at Seafloor Systems. And for us, the proof is in the work. When you passionately engage your customers on what they dream of or ask for, and as a company, you embrace fearless experimentation, even when sometimes you get your feelings hurt or something sinks, literally, you can still create some fun experiences for your bots. Now, you may be asking yourselves, how does a company like ours approach R&D on such a breadth of project types? Well, first off, <laughs> even after 20 years in business, we don't really show our age. We continue to approach each problem with the quick iteration that a startup would. Now, I like to think that we attack problems like they're part of our first sale. We also actively seek out strategic partnerships with new and innovative companies as much as we can. Our fleet of robot boats is an interesting proving ground to test the capabilities of any product or service. Since we embrace open source technologies, including ROS, we will often reach out to our university partners to see if they are working on research that we can assist with or demonstrate on one of our boats. Now, this is with the hopes that we can advance maritime robotics in any way we can. We also try to envision every pro project that we take on as having to scale to hundreds or thousands of robots, which frames the integration and deployment methodology in a non-unicorn way. Now, as an example, for one of our latest product releases, we announced a collision avoidance assistance system. Now, we knew we wanted our current autonomy stack to advance, and our customers wanted the ability to have greater protection to their equipment while collecting data in environments with static and moving objects. We started our development by envisioning the core capabilities we would need and analyzing capabilities from all forms of autonomous systems. This process helps us not to look not only at what's being currently done in the maritime space, but also what the art of the possible is across all industries. Now, from this initial ideation phase, we started to look at what companies we felt were paradigm shifting and reached out to make relationships. Now, part of my job is to read the tea leaves of the industry at large and try to figure out who out there can help us get closer to our goals. For CAA, this started with Oster, who created a LiDAR that not only could provide our boats with laser eyes, <laughs> but who also beat up their products as much as we knew that they were gonna get beat up in our world. Now, once we decided on a LiDAR pipeline, we got to work, building the first phases of our CAA system on two fronts. Now, we knew our boats were not only gonna need to be able to see with their new laser eyes, they would also eventually need to understand what they were seeing. So while part of the project was dedicated to object detection and avoidance using LiDAR, we also dedicated part of our team to computer vision. This included going out to local lakes, marinas, and streams to collect, annotate, and train custom computer vision models so we could test them in staging. Now, since our team is small, it is important for us to approach most of our R&D projects in this multi-pronged approach so that we can continually test in the field. Now, this also means that we are very comfortable not being the smartest people in the room, especially when we're taking on a challenging project. Now, a perfect example of this is sensor fusion. We knew that getting all these sensors to communicate with well together and provide structurally sound data to our boats was going to be a challenge. So we reached, we sought out and found expertise. Now, many times, these conversations don't start with a perfect off-the-shelf solution ready for deployment. 
So when we reached out to Tangram and Vision for their expertise in sensor fusion, it wasn't because they had a list of all of our sensors on some white paper somewhere. We saw what they were doing and where they were trying to go, and these are the relationships we like to make at Seafloor because we know that we will grow, experiment, and, and eventually learn together. Now, as I mentioned before, at Seafloor we dream big. And part of this vision has not only been to put our autonomous boats to advance underwater exploration, but to embrace the power of IoT technology and cloud-enabled robotics to get closer to the dream of mobile machine learning pipelines collecting data on the water. Now this idea of having an autonomous robot boat analyze data in the field and broadcast post-processed data through advancing IoT technologies is what guided us to cl AWS Cloud Robotics in the first place. We knew that any system we designed would have to be a learning system capable of getting updates and continually trained models over the air anywhere in the world. And by framing the challenge and our desired solution in that way, we were able to build our development, training, and deployment pipeline using AWS technologies in a way that we knew could meet customer demand any way they send it to us. So our CAA development pipeline is just a brief example of how we approach research and development. But after 20 years in business, and as all R&D teams learn, it is a difficult transition from the world of ideas to the actual product roadmap, and even more difficult to align those ideas to the customer appetite. For our fleet of robots to keep thriving in a continually advancing technological landscape, we discovered that some of the, there were some core tenets that we would need to adhere to. Our robots would need to be robust, customizable, and portable when portability mattered. They would also need the ability to have the latest tech integrated. We also greatly value our collaboration that we have with our university partners and our customers. So our systems would need to be able to be usable in that format. Our company, team, and robots would need to be open for experimentation. And lastly, our systems would have to be ever-expanding. So let me start off with the, the first seafloor tenant and show you why robust platforms matter. For me, when I think about what makes a robot boat robust, it truly comes down to two things. First, where it can go. And then, how long it will be required to be working there. Now, when I think of one of our robots going to an inhospitable place, the first thought that comes to mind is the Arctic. And in 2019, that is exactly where one of our Ecobus got a chance to work. Dr. Larry Mayer from the University of New Hampshire and Dr. Martin Jacobson of Stockholm University led a group of national and international researchers to northern Greenland on the icebreaker Odin to survey areas surrounding the Bezel Fjord and Ryder glaciers. Now, to bring any equipment on these scientific missions is very costly and logistically difficult. So having our system work in these conditions and help answer important scientific questions is exciting to see. Now, during this time in the frigid water, there were areas that were previously covered in ice that were now exposed by rising sea temperatures. And Seafloor's echo boat was used to either corroborate uh, multi-beam sonar data from the, from the icebreaker Odin, or to collect data where the icebreaker was not able to go. Now, the echo boat is 1.7 meters long, and they equipped it with a, hundred, uh, with a Pico, 120 kilohertz multi-beam echo sounder with integrated motion and positioning. Now, the two people that were responsible for the operation were Sam Reed Widener and Kevin Jerram, who are affiliated with the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the NOAA UNH Joint Hydrographic Center. Now, as you can see, the echo boat was deployed from the icebreaker Odin and often controlled with a remote control. But most echo boat operations were in support of the land team. So you can see Kevin here hopping into a helicopter to go head over to the land. To supplement the coring and other data collection activities, the echo boat ASV team provided auxiliary bathymetrics mapping support to the lake teams. Now, Sam and Kevin would prep the ASV every night and fly it out in the hel helicopter, and they collect as much bath bathymetry data as possible. And now at times, they would run the ASV in autonomous mode and just observe it with binoculars. Like the many parts of the ocean that remain unmapped, there are also considerable parts of the Arctic that remain unresearched because of how difficult the conditions are. 
multidisciplinary research is critical to maximize output for the amount of effort. Now in these pictures from the Hall Land Basin, you can see examples of some teams looking for clams on shore while the Echo Boat team was mapping out the very shallow basin working around icebergs. All the while, crude boats were mapping out deeper than the Echo Boat, uh, roughly over five feet in depth. Five, sorry, five meters in depth. Five feet would be too low. <laughs> and the Odin workboat Munin was collecting broadband multi-water column data. Now, because of the huge number of people out in the basin, with a lot of them working on the land, they attracted a fair amount of attention from the locals, especially when they decided someone came up with the idea to collect grab samples with the helicopter, and they deemed that helo clamming. So the second metric that can be considered a metric for robustness is how long a robot will be need to be working at a task. Some jobs, by the nature of their scope, are going to be long running. And any project that lasts months or even years requires everyone showing up to work ready to work. A project Seafloor is involved with right now is in the state of Virginia, where an expansion of the region's most congested corridors is in the works. Now this project not only comes with a huge price tag at over $3.8 billion, it is also the largest highway construction project in Virginia's history. And not only that, it's one of the largest infrastructure projects in the United States right now. Now every infrastructure project has complexity, but if you add to this the constantly changing conditions with large scale dredging operations, a need is created for a system that can continually survey the environment. The information that is collected during these surveys is critical driver to operational decisions. Now our HydroCat 180 is there to work every day. Now to give you an idea of the immense undertaking this project is, the Virginia Department of Transportation HRBT expansion project team shared this picture with us of the North Island expansion, where one of our largest ASVs is minuscule in comparison. There she is. Now mind you, the HydroCat isn't a small ASV in, by any means. The Hampton Roads Bridge and Tunnel expansion will take years to complete. It is actually scheduled for completion in November 2025, which means our robot boat will be reporting for duty throughout that time. Now for us at Seafloor, we take that long-term service as proof of how important robust robotic platforms are. But what does a robotic company do when the task at hand isn't something they plan for? That's when customizability stands up front and center. We realized early on at Seafloor that we couldn't guarantee every environment our robot boats were gonna work in was gonna be the same. So we looked to design and integrate internal control systems that were modular enough to operate any boat design we threw at them. Now the California Aqueduct provides all Southern California with water. I live in San Diego, so this, for this, for me, this is really important. When the aqueduct was built, it was unfortunately placed where two continental plates met, forming the San Andreas Fault. Because of the earthquakes along this region, the aqueduct has cracks and structural issues all throughout. Now, every 10 miles, there are gates that open and close to control the flow of water. To maintain these gates, the practice was to send two divers down that were tethered together to clean off any debris that had accumulated. This process is extremely dangerous and arduous to do. And because of the safety concerns, the California Department of Water Resources did not want anyone within 10 to 20 feet of the aqueduct. Now with this access restriction and the 24 inch clearance of pipes that extended over the aqueduct, it made it so none of our standard ASVs would work. When we were approached by the California Department of Water Resources, the requirements consisted of a recess platform and the ability to be launched and recovered from a mobile crane. Now picture that, having to launch and recover every 10 mile section of an aqueduct with no person being able to get near the water to help connect the lifting mechanism. To add to the complexity, there was a need to survey, survey around the pilings, and, but the access to move around the pilings changed almost at every juncture. Some, you, you could just drive around, but others, you, the HydroCat 150 had to crab walk to get access and then speed up to get to the next piling. It was challenging conditions enough, but on top of that, it had three knot currents, and that didn't make it any easier. Now, for, for all the people that are non-maritime audience, the water, that means that water is moving below our robot boat at five feet per second. 
Now to accomplish this task, we had to fully customize our existing designs while still maintaining the same performance and stability we had built in the past. Now to give you an idea of why this project was interesting, during our first one day demonstration, we did a 15 mile segment. And during that time, we saw 11 cars sunk in the aqueduct. That's roughly a car a mile. So to acquire this data, we teamed two Teledyne CBAT T50s in a dual head configuration with a high density overwater LIDAR so that we could collect both sides of the aqueduct all the way up to the coping and above. Now we knew that this was going to be a dynamically changing environment. So we had to design a data collection system that would accurately capture data in one large swath. Now we demoed, <laughs> we demoed by driving the HydroCat 150 with remote control from a moving vehicle. <laughs> But eventually, thankfully, the HydroCat was able to be used autonomously to navigate down the center between the gates, and we successfully mapped all 444 miles of the California Aqueduct. Now, the original HydroCat design was built for the Army Corps of Engineers uh, of the San Francisco Sausalito District for surveying operations under the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, because of the high wind conditions and choppy waves, a monohull vessel would rock too much for accurate data collection. So our ocean engineer, JT Myers, came up with the idea for a gimbaled suspension system on a catamaran design. With this suspension system, it allowed the heavy multi-beam sonar to remain relatively plumb to the area that was being surveyed. It was those types of conditions that led the United States Geological Service, Service to consider using the HydroCat, HydroCat 180 to survey the California Delta. The USGS had previously used our monohull robots, but the conditions in the Delta meant they needed our new customized design. Now the Delta is an extremely diverse environment. It is influenced by the Pacific Ocean and all the ocean tidal changes, but it's also randomly influenced by rainfall in the Sierra Mountains, as well as rain in the Central Valley. Now on top of that, it takes 30 minutes to cross, and in that time, water level changes as much as 10 feet. All of these conditions made monitoring the impacts of saltwater intrusion into the delta inconsistent and potentially hazardous for the crude boats that were trying to collect the data. So not only did we have to customize the design, we had to customize the way the HydroCats were used. By using tandem HydroCat 180s, we cut the data collection time in half and significantly increased the accuracy of the resulting water flow and depth model. Now, it would be easy to stand up here and pretend that every design we build is sprinkled with magical narwhal glitter and critically acclaimed. But as a robotics custom company that is crazy enough to put robots in the water, we have a bit of a thick skin when it comes to criticism. So when I was in the room listening to a respectful but intense disagreement about the portability of our boats between one of our customers and Seafloor's founder and CEO, John Tamplin, I paid particular attention. Scattered throughout the backwoods and mountainous regions of California, there are bodies of water miles from paved streets, highways, or convenient access points like unpaved fire roads. Some of these bodies of water need to be maintained, especially if they're involved in the generation of power, transport of water, or designed to deal with emergency runoff in some type of atmospheric event. So drawing from his experience as a US Navy hydrographer and sonar technician, John, John challenged the seafloor team to come up with a USV design that could be fit and be launched from a torpedo tube. This concept ended up transforming into our third technical tenant and a potential response to the portability of disagreement with our customer. From that initial challenge, we created our most portable, uncrewed surface vehicle, the Tridrum. Now our manufacturing facilities are up a steep elevation change from Folsom, California in a small town called Shingle Springs. You don't really set up shop in the gold country foothills without attracting a fair amount of local talent that enjoy the outdoors. Now anytime I'm up at HQ, there's some discussion about some boulder that's gonna get climbed or some trail that's gonna get bombed down by a mountain bike. In that type of environment, when you come up with a triple pontoon design that folds into thirds, eventually, someone's gonna say, hey, let's slap that thing in a backpack and go hike it out somewhere. <laughs> Understanding customers' pain points, even when they come in the form of criticism, can often open up new opportunities, if, as a team, you're willing to listen. Now, not all the uses of our robot boats come directly from cu customer engagement. 
That's the reason we have honed some of our designs on our ASVs to make modifications by our end users a bit, easy, bit easier. One simple example of this is on our bulkhead, where wa all the waterproof of sensors, uh, antennas, and anything else really, transitions from out of the boat into the hull. We designed and implemented a modular plate design that can be changed and adjusted by simply swapping cable mounting plates. So our fleet of robot boats do have a life of their own when they get out in the wild. So it is important for us to make sure they can incorporate any tech that may be needed. This is especially true if the technology doesn't currently exist or the use of that technology stack is in a way that we never thought of. A perfect example of this is when roughly 6,500 miles away and on the other side of the globe, there was, there was computer vision work that was being done on our hydrone that was for a completely different purpose than our own computer vision work. The National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research centers their environmental science mission on the sustainable management of New Zealand's natural resources. Freshwater ecologist Dr. Daniel Clements and principal technician Jeremy Bouliid sought to build a computer, a computer vision system that could recognize two of New Zealand's worst invasive weeds and catalog their GPS positions. By leveraging cameras and hydroacoustic systems on our autonomous hydrone, they were able to train a neural network to pick out invasive species from their native counterparts. This type of environmental research using AI and robotics can open, up a new, can open up new and inventive ways to manage submerged weeds that cost millions of dollars annually to mitigate. For Seafloor, seeing our robots being used in ways we couldn't have even imagined is why we stand by our fifth tenant. Our collaboration with research institutions is one of the ways that we understand the challenges faced by field roboticists and scientists. It is important for us to build and maintain these relationships so the impact of our bots can grow between these organizations. What I've personally discovered and experienced from my interactions with these academic institutions is that these innovative ideas are, are, are a relay race. Often, one enthusiastic student or team of students will grab the baton and run it down the track. But the finish line, if there really is ever a finish line in scientific research, is often reached by someone else who grabbed the baton along the way. Now let me walk you through one such relay where our Echo Boat 160 starts off at the University of New Hampshire's Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping Joint Hydrographic Center. Now, this might seem just like a fun day out playing with a robot boat, and I have to admit that even some of my San Diego test days have a bit of a vacation feel, especially when my toes are in the sand. But these testing and training sessions do lead to unique research in the hands of academics. As an example, UNH graduate student Sam Reed used the Echo Boat to test algorithms to convert electronic nautical charts into risk maps, which can also, then also be used by robotic path planners to navigate safely. Now here's an example of an electronic nautical chart in, New, uh, in Portsmouth Harbor in New Hampshire. Now here's the same map, but with the risk map Sam generated from the charted data where the red indicates uh, areas of high risk. Now there's three paths that have been planned on this map, and each one has a dis different risk condition. The Echo Boat was also used in another part of Sam's master thesis, in which he prototyped use of a nautical chart to reactively avoid obstacles. Now, as a proof of concept, you can see this intended path here was planned over a charted hazard. Now, the algorithms assess the threat of the obstacle as well as the surrounding areas and plan a new safe route accordingly. But the relay doesn't stop there. Expanding on Sam's ideas, Val Schmidt and Roland Arsenault of CECOM JHC developed Project 11. This backseat driver of autonomous surface vehicles uses those same depth-based cost maps to navigate during data collection survey missions. Since it is based in ROS and open source, our Echo Boat was a great candidate platform to use Project 11 on. But even more important, Project 11 is platform agnostic. So as ROS drivers are developed for devices, they can be incorporated into the system for use in the field. Now imagine my enthusiasm when Seafloor was asked by the University of Delaware to mentor students enrolled in their Master of Science in Robotics program. 
The student's goal was to incorporate Project 11 into their school's echo boat located at, the, at their Lewis, Delaware campus in a way that the research could be continued by future students. So grabbing the baton and in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> through a lot of Docker containers and Docker composed files and with a fair share of Zoom calls, I got to witness these master's students enthusiastically run our echo boat in their test harbor for their first time. Now, once in the hands of UDEL students, the baton got passed once again. Grant Otto, Cleo Baxavani, Owen Lee, and their academic advisors, Dr. Bert Tanner and Dr. R. Trambanis, looked to add features to Project 11. Now, to understand the motivation behind this addition, let me show you a little bit of how Project 11 works. A survey pattern, which we can think of as mowing the lawn, is built into CAMP, which is the mission planner. Now, the survey pattern is placed over a raster image background. Now, in this example, you can see that it's a geotiff, which allows a hydrographic surveyor to bring in um, previously collected data to plan missions around areas that are not already collected. This group of UDL students decided to, they wanted to incorporate a way to dynamically outline the survey area within Project 11 and then have their own lawnmower pattern basically enclosed inside. Now I'm gonna use one of the students, Grant Otto's words exactly, to help convey why they pursued this research. Now I quote, when we were out to test the in situ mission planning feature, we did a control test using the chart planning only and mistakenly pointed out the exact problem with chart based mission planning, which is that it, the charts are pretty accurate spatially, but they're a snapshot in time. So for that test, we actually ran the boat aground on some quickly growing marsh grass, seen in the picture in your slides, or my slides, yeah, my slides, and ran into the dock that had been constructed after the chart was published, all by accident. That was solved with the in situ mission planning, where we drove the boat around the pond and created a survey outline and then mapped it. Now here's a quick walk through the process. Since there is an uncharted dock that we need to contend with, we know that we have to use the mission planning features in Project 11 in a different way. So the first step is to record the survey area around the dock, then add waypoints to mark the rest of the survey area. And then we constrain this, uh, the survey path in a new outline survey area. Then we just send our robot boat to collect data without running into a pesky dock. Simple enough. Now, in one more pass of the baton, last month at ICRA 2022, at the Robotics for Climate Change work workshop, Cleo Baxivani, Grant Otto, Dr. Tanner, and Dr. Trambanis presented a new motion controller tested on our ECOBOAT 160 and built upon the UNH's Project 11. This motion planner focuses on maintaining an optimal acceleration by controlling the ECOBOAT's path falling within Project 11. By implementing this change, this team of roboticists was able to greatly improve the captured data from multi-beam sonar data. And by presenting their findings to the world and contributing their additions back into the open source project, Project 11, the next batch of enthusiastic students and marine scientists and roboticists can grab the baton next. So just like our university research partners, for Seafloor to keep innovating, our ASVs, as well as our team, has to be open for experimentation. At Seafloors, we ask ourselves if people would think of us and our robots when they want to push the boundaries. Because for us, out of these challenges, we learn tremendous amounts about what changes we need to be made to our fleet and what elements need to be put into, an R, into our R&D pipeline. When mine technology came to us, to be part of a demonstration at the Advanced Naval Technology Exercise, or ANTAX, they were already pushing the technology envelope. Their goal was to demonstrate Klein Marine Systems multi-angle, X-pattern, side-scan sonar system, but wanted to showcase what a future could look like for naval oceanography. They thought of Seafloor as an autonomous platform to launch and recover the side-scan sonar, allowing the warfighter to get precise precisions uh, precise positions of hazards while also maintaining safe operational distance. So we're off to the races. To design and integrate a launch and recovery system and de demonstrate that capability September 2020 at Antex in Florida. Now, 
you may remember a few key elements about those dates and times and locations. First, we were in the middle of COVID. So there was travel limitations and logis logistics challenges across the nation. Now on top of that, Hurricane Laura and Marco had pounded the region. So let's just say that the development and demonstration was filled with challenges. But Seafloor and Mind were able to successfully complete what was a major accomplishment for such an experimental project. But remember, for this sixth tenant, I mentioned we wanted people to think of Seafloor and our robot boats for their experimental projects, which is why it was a pleasure to see our echo boat being part of an extensive R&D project to cre create an autonomous way to inspect dock safety. Now, my French is literally non-existent, so I will just say that the team spearheading this project is the uh, Interdisciplinary Center for the Development of Ocean Mapping, <laughs> or CITCO. Now, CITCO is an R&D organization based in Quebec whose work focuses around advancing marine geo geomatics and hydrospatial technologies. This project undertaking is a major collaborative effort among a lot of ports, partners, and scientific institutions from our neighbors to the north. And the goals they are trying to accomplish are major, so they will, they will require all those additional hands. Now, I love projects like this because it is applied research. There is definitive timelines of events and, act, and an active testing schedule where we are going to see the accomplishments happen in the very ports and harbors that would benefit most from the project itself. Now, as a quick project overview, the prevailing mission is to autonomously, autonomous, uh, autonomously survey ports with the goal of inspecting the docks to see if there is many, any immediate safety risks or if the docks themselves need, are in need of repair because they are degraded in some way. Now, to accomplish this, a few things need to happen. First, there needs to be an autonomous navigation system that not only maintains good survey speeds, but can also avoid collisions with the very objects that are being analyzed. Now, to fully understand the health of a dock, the data collection needs to be, to be done above and below the water. The high-density LIDAR data and the multi-beam sonar data then needs to be accurately stitched together. Now, once captured, a digital twin of the environment is fundamentally created. Now, this digital twin can then be used to perform analysis of the surfaces to de like detect cracks or degradation before they become problematic. Also, the twin can be used to implement an early warning system for quick detection of collapsing walls or other potential hydrodynamic problems. With all of this work and research being done on our robot boats throughout the world, we realized our robotic platforms will need to be ever expanding. The maritime robotics field is continually advancing, and so we need to make sure our platforms will grow beyond what we can envision today. So where do we go from here? One of the areas of research I am most excited about is using reinforcement learning to teach our ASVs how to navigate around our environment. Coral Moreno is doing some amazing research at UNH's School of Marine Science and Ocean Engineering on this very topic. Building upon a Project 11 backbone and leveraging open source technologies, Coral has effectively pulled together some of the most advanced techniques utilized by autonomous systems today. For those of you who aren't, who aren't familiar, reinforcement learning is a process of using observations about the state of an autonomous agent, in this case of a simulated or real ASV, to reward actions that move the agent toward a desired goal. So instead of telling her ASV how to get from point A to point B, Coral helped a robot boat, both in simulation and in the real world, learn how to move from point A to point B. Now what excites me most about this research is there are many challenges where Seafloor's ASVs operate that are difficult to solve because of how unstructured the environment is. Utilizing transformers and genetic algorithms with deep reinforcement learning is poised to teach our robot boats things that we could only dream of. Now our goal is to find ways to curate simulation to real pipelines on our fleet to help promote the research that scientists like Coral, Mor Coral Moreno are doing, as well as to work with students to test RL on our fleet. 
because we, and because we chose to embrace open source technology, as did AWS Robotics, we are able to leverage cloud scale to help these innovative ideas come to life. But this work is not possible without the amazing work that has come before us. Open Robotics and the Open Source Robotics Foundation pioneered and continue to push the edges of what is capable in robotics. AWS Robotics brings tooling and scale that innovates beyond what many of us can do internally or even dream about. And then there are the people who every day continue to take their valuable expertise and support the open source robotics community. Even the screenshots you see here couldn't have been possible without the work of people like Dr. Brian Bingham, Reese Manwaring, Will Selby, and so many others. They inspired small teams like ours and bring to light the true art of the possible. On top of that work, the work that we will do with our research and university partners, Seafloor will keep putting new designs on the roadmap to add to our robot fleet. We keep getting asked to take on more challenging waters and increase our capability. Because of this, we have our first gas-powered autonomous platform in the works, while moving most of our perception stack to greater GPU use so that our ASVs can, uh, can react appropriately. Our next re revision of the HydraCat 180 is already in works, based on feedback from our current customers and prospective customers. And we will continue to work with universities and research partners to develop ROS2 connectivity in our, into our fleet so we can leverage the cutting edge simulation and training capabilities of AWS Cloud Robotics. We are excited by the Docker integration and AWS RoboMaker, as well as the 3D point cloud labeling and sensor fusion elements with, within SageMaker Ground Truth, and now even the synthetic data creation. And more than anything else, Seafloor will continue to work extremely hard to build autonomous robot boats that get to go on amazing adventures and do important work. Thank you so much for listening and spending some time with me. I get really excited about the wonderful things Seafloor is doing. It has been a really honor to share these stories with you. Thank you so much.